Jeff Contro and his crew from Shelly Williams, and I am Kenny Schultz, the nerd. We're in, we're in Chicago today. Shout out, Chicago. Shout out. Yeah. And more importantly, we're here to talk about what kind of things we can figure out in coordination. The main to- topic for the day's tour, we've, we've talked to developers and uh, GCs and trade. Well, I'm here to talk to mostly trade contractors or people in the trades <clears throat> about coordination and what it means to y'all. And mostly the reality is that everybody kind of believes that it's important, but not a single person it, it takes any accountability for when fucking shit goes wrong. So uh, the idea is to let, you know, talk about that and so that everybody can see how differently everybody's opinion of that one word is. Um, you know, and, and engineers, on my perspective, for example, is that I'm often, you know, blamed for a fuck up where, uh, and you guys may also have this experience where I'm, I'm fucking designing some shit and then I don't know, I'm given this much construction tolerance and maybe one inch, which is massive. And then like, uh, the ductwork goes wrong and then they say you didn't coordinate or some bullshit or the ceilings were supposed to have been insulated or sprinkler was installed before you have shop drawings and all this stuff. And then the finger pointing game goes wrong. We, we'll get into this, but then there's other things like there's no budget for X, Y, Z, and then you sell or design something that's not necessarily going to work. <laughs> you try your best to explain why it won't work. Somebody buys it, and then they're saying you fucked it up. So from our perspective as the, the consulting engineers, we're often caught in between being told we either over-engineered it or messed up the engineering, and when it goes right, you never hear from it. I guess that's pretty true in construction in general. But this word coordination seems a little bit misused. So... Anyhow, let me uh, let me bring you guys back on here. There's a lot of echo here. So Jeff, you have a or whoever, whoever else, interesting story, right? Of a constraint of humidity. We don't have to dig into the details about who or what, but maybe can you generally go over like what, what the problem is with that project? So my name is Jeff Conzro. I'm vice president of Shelley Williams Company. Got with us today Bo Hamrick, that is with Shelly Williams, sales engineer, and Dave Merchant, who is a facilities engineer at Colonial Williamsburg in Virginia. Thought it'd be a good idea to have uh, a couple different perspectives on this topic here from everywhere, everyone from Kenny being the engineer, us being sales engineers that are designing and helping Kenny design systems and pick equipment and all that good stuff. And then Dave, as a facilities engineer, who actually works on the equipment, has to deal with the equipment, long cycle, and all that stuff. So um, what Kenny is bringing reference to is a, a recent project that Bo sold that was a, what we consider kind of a poor man's clean room, um, a customer that wants a lab to hold a certain temperature and humidity and they're not willing to pay for clean room equipment. They're not in the $600,000 budget range. They're more in the $150,000 budget range. And they give us parameters of said temperatures and humidities that they're looking for. But in reality, they're not willing to pay for tight control and high-end equipment like we would typically see in a clean room environment or something like that. They're just trying to get their parameters covered for as cheap as possible. And so what resulted was an eight ton heat pump to keep the lab comfortable, sensible temperature wise, a wall mounted steam humidifier to keep the humidity in check, a floor mounted dehumidifier to keep the humidity in check when it gets high in the summer. And then obviously some infiltration air coming into the space and an ERV that is designed to ventilate the space and keep it, you know, within check. And Bo, would you like to to talk about what happened here and and where we're at? Yeah, so um, basically the uh, start of the project, they came to me with a a, a budget that um, to me was uh, on the very low end of their expectations. Uh, I took that uh, to an engineer and says, uh, you know, here's the parameters. This is the budget. This is what I would do as far as equipment selection, since I am the the manufacturer's rep, and this is what I know best, and I think this will work the best um, based upon what I've been given and put on my plate. Um, 
uh, the engineer ran the loads. Uh, everything was in accordance with what I had initially thought. We put them on some drawings. They accepted the drawings. It went out uh, for bid, and uh, obviously they picked the the lowest bid, which was perfectly fine. I was um, had a good relationship with the contractor. He put in all of my equipment in accordance with the uh, mechanical drawings that they had previously accepted. Uh, after we get the systems up and running, uh, it, it seemed as though, uh, from our point of view, uh, it, you know, everything was golden. Um, now they're holding us to this particular uh, humidity humidity parameters that they had set forth, which was fifty percent uh, humidity plus or minus five percent. And that's great. Uh, you know, in my eyes, uh, that's, you know, we're, we're trying to keep an average of that. And uh, the equipment doesn't have a problem doing that. However, they have uh, their own control system within the space and uh, are pulling this data uh, for relative humidity based upon their sensors and, and their equipment. Uh, and we're going outside of their parameters. I would say maybe three three percent every seventy two hours. Um, and they're coming back to us saying they're not going to pay us because um, you know it's it's going outside. There's little peaks and valleys in there that are outside that plus minus five percent, which um, you know, Again, their budget was low. They wanted to do this cheap. It's a 30-year-old building. We're not talking about a, a million-dollar clean room. It's not ruining a product. It's not uh, doing anything out of relevance uh, for what they need it for, but they're holding our feet to the fire. And um, <clears throat> their expectations are uh, a lot higher than the real world of everybody in this trade of the engineer, uh, a technician, um, the the manufacturing rep that that has the equipment, um, you know, mechanical equipment's only capable of of, of so much. Um, and without a tight construction, being a retrofit, everything goes out of out of context. And long story short, we're still not paid, and they are still really really concerned about this uh three percent outside of their parameter for humidity which is absurd to me but um it's kind of hard to argue with them yeah, when what they're do they have listening. in there that need that is crit that is that critical like mission critical that three percent <clears throat> would break or make it so they're making plastics um for all kinds of uh different manufacturers across the world as far as uh, cars um sometimes even film for uh of let's just say Kodak, um, very different things. They're basically like plastic pebbles that they uh, melt together and they have to stay within a certain quality control for over 72 hours to be passed and go into production. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, 3% out of 72 hours is not ruining a product. It's yeah. <laughs> so do they have existing facilities where they do accomplish those no. tolerances? This, yeah. this building has been there for 30 years. They've been doing this kind of stuff. Um, evidently, someone came to them, uh, whoever they got a partnership with, and said, this is what we want from you, and that's why they updated the... Uh, Okay, so the, yeah. so it's a third party contractor, or that they have a third party contractor agreement to say we're going to work with you guys, but you have to meet us and these parameters, which may or may not have been made clear. But then, yeah, we'll get into that. But like, so the idea is, hey, we need this contract, and so and so that we have a contract with is as long as you can produce under these constraints, then we will work with you on their contract. And then they went through an upgrade in their facility, right? It's, right. And then and then now here we are today, every seventy two hours, three percent out of whack or whatever, which in all things human who three percent right i mean jesus Christ. doors opening yeah, people we have, moving yeah, around yeah. i mean anything can change that in a in a heartbeat which it does and yeah we we do have modulating equipment so uh as jeff mentioned it's a vrf system uh we're modulating all the time our temperature mm -hmm. is perfect um it's it's a little bit more reactive than humidity obviously yeah. um but um the the humidity you can see uh, whenever something gets out of whack, and then I return the the question to them, hey, 
you know, what happened at this time? Because I can obviously see something uh, was out of whack. Was it the humidifier that was not um, uh, acting correctly? Or was it, uh, did you hold a door open for this long? Uh, and no one can give me really answers. Yeah, we get fed a lot. We, we go through the lot. You know, I've, I've uh, often usually start with like what commissioning has been done. So on this project, has there been commissioning? Has anybody gone through and commissioned it? And so um, I, I didn't mention this before. I, I am a master HVAC tradesman. I was in the, in the field for about 12 years. So uh, Jeff had actually uh, came to me at the, about the end of my HVAC career. I was almost done with it. And he said, hey, you know, uh, come be a manufacturer rep and, and sell equipment for me, Yeah, yeah. which I did. So um, I'm very familiar with how HVAC equipment works. So yeah. the stuff that I sell, I typically commission myself. Um, and that, oh, good. that gives me good relationships with my customers. Um, and obviously I have a good understanding of of what's going on in the job and how to correct things um, and uh, provide some technical support when needed. So uh, yes, I have been on the job several times. I've been in direct coordination with the manufacturer of the humidifier. Um, we have set dead bands. We have uh, tried different things that seem to make a small adjustments, but uh, you know, 72 hour period, even if it's 1% out there, yeah. they're very strict about this. So that's good. So the follow up would be, you have all this experience for 15 years. You've seen it, you've, you've done all the testing commissioning. Have you ever in your experience seen something with that level of tolerance? No, met? I, I've never had a customer this, um, uh, for lack of a better word, anal about, uh, <laughs> yeah you know, what, what they're really supposed to be doing. And I think one of the problems is they don't, they're not educated enough to understand um, how this stuff works yeah. and how temperature affects humidity, even though I've given them a psychometric chart um, mm -hmm. and trying to explain it to them, it's just not resonating with them. Yep. Um, and long story short, you know, we're just, uh, there's, 30 some grand had held back on the contractor because uh, we can't get the 72 hour test uh, passed. Yeah. I think it should be noted that as a company, Shelly Williams has done multiple clean rooms, labs, things that have extremely tight tolerances. Yeah. yeah. Things that are, that, that are defined at the beginning of the process that, hey, we are doing a Michigan critical type application. Mm -hmm. And this was never defined as a mission critical type application. Yeah, yeah. How many times have we seen something come across our desk that just has the regular ash rate parameters of, you know, plus or minus three degrees Fahrenheit mm -hmm. and plus or minus five percent relative humidity? Mm -hmm. We see it all day. We don't do anything differently. It's just kind of a generic statement of we want the building to be normalized and not out of control. And these people have have taken what we assume to be just a normal design and now they're demanding almost clean room type uh specs to to adhere to and that was never clearly defined and i think uh you guys you know hit the nail on the head earlier if they had if they had come out and said if it cannot stay within this certain parameter then we have a problem mm -hmm. it was presented to us as just a generic spec and, and I think that's where the disconnect is. And being able to look back on this, I think we need to educate our customers more on how important is this? Because yeah. if this is extremely important, then you're in a $600,000, $700,000 job. Yeah. You're not in a $150,000 job. Where, did, was there, did they go through that value engineering? Did you have something designed initially? And then they said, oh, we can't do that. We don't have this budget or anything like that. So I had a fairly uh, good relationship with um, the facilities engineer on this project. And we had walked through that and even got with the lab engineers and explained to them, you know, this is what I'm proposing. This is what I think you need. Um, and everybody seemed to make the same page. And again, they gave mm -hmm. us very general specifications. So yeah. I took that with a grain of salt. Uh, they don't know what they're doing. They didn't uh, lay it out in a detailed description. It just said 50% mm -hmm. plus or minus five degrees. Yeah. Uh, and it was uh, seven, I think the temperature was 73.5 plus or minus three degrees. Yeah. And I was like, okay, well, that's 
that's pretty easy to do. Yeah. Uh, especially because this place is underground. It's a, you know, it's a level underground with insulated walls, except yep. for uh, one room that has a swinging door out to a mill room, which is unconditioned. Mm -hmm. uh, and that creates problems right now as well. Yeah. Infiltration. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, they keep on asking me these questions. I thought we talked about this at the beginning. I thought we talked about I'm like, yes, we did. But like as engineering and the design team, mm -hmm. we're assuming a lot of things. You gave us a very generalized scope. Yeah. So whenever we're doing this, we're trying to assume the worst, but the the there's a fine line between over engineering and oversizing equipment because then we yeah. start short cycling and this yep. and that and that's why i put all modulating equipment on the job too yep because in their in their specs they also had a some terminology in there as uh we had to be energy efficient we had to provide free cooling mm -hmm. which that got thrown out the window because i'm like well if you want free cooling plus you want to keep the humidity right mm -hmm. that's never going to work mm -hmm. i mean it's just that it can't happen, especially in a 30 by 30 room. You mean like <laughs> economizer or something, you know, using... Um, so they want a VRF because it wanted to meet... Um, they, they don't... It's a German-owned company, and I'm going to go into all that, but um, they mm. were very, you know, uh, energy strict. Oh, so, I got you. Yeah. Um, uh, they had a conventional eight-ton system there prior to this, mm -hmm. um, and it's, uh, you know, an old uh, carrier... A split system had two four ton compressors in the roof and then you yeah. know an old conventional like vertical air handler anyway um yeah I, I went to the vrf and i said well you can't provide free free cooling with vrf that's not gonna happen mm -hmm. so i uh proposed the erv which was a, a great solution to yeah. bring in air temper it yep. uh, stick it into the vrf system it wouldn't be uh, sticking cold air on the back side of the coil mm -hmm. therefore the vrf would be able to temper it somewhat the obviously the dehumidifier the humidifier so i had everything you know mm -hmm. to the best of my knowledge was going to make this thing happen and everything does work great um yeah. but they're they are just uh holding on to this uh humidity issue with uh with their life well we have <clears throat> yeah i mean I, I totally feel your pain because the expectations versus reality in this industry is like the heart of like coordination always turns into a shit show it's like, uh, well, and that's why I really am starting to not like that word and, and rather just be, be, let's talk about what the risk is because it's there no matter what. In this situation, when your tolerances are this tight, do you have it planned in your budget to assume enough contingency for things that we can't foresee? Or do you want to give me another $400,000 to just perfectly engineer this and have every initial good condition you could possibly imagine be modeled? And by the way, when I say modeled, I mean making assumptions, mm -hmm. which is, your infiltration, how, how many times is the door gonna open? Like that I'm gonna have this insula installation here or that it's perfectly installed for the detail and we all know that half the building isn't. So we have to make assumptions. A lot of people don't know about HVAC that we're essentially weathermen. We're guessing that roughly the weather for the next 15 years will, will function in some way that the past 20 years or however long has told us. So, so just off the bat, we're already making ridiculous guesses and people think that it's perfect science. It's absolutely not. And then the assumption you have to make out about a building envelope. If you have a large building with all types of single pane glass, was that you telling me? Yeah. yeah. And all this other stuff mixed with new windows. Are you going to really pay some energy model or person to go model every single 600 of your windows perfectly? So your load calc's there. Or are we going to generally make an assumption about what might be coming and going? Because you can spend more than this equipment by 10 times to on the soft to cost to just figure out the perfect model. And it's just unreasonable. It's better to they say, well, let's just put a little bit more contingency in the construction budget to assume things are not going to go as planned because we don't have the time. We don't have the money to perfectly plan it. And that has been successful for us as consultants with developers to say, look, dude, we were talking to Duke last time and he mentioned in his smaller projects, he has higher contingency for that reason. He just knows that they're going to go wrong. Smart. And he's a smart developer, right? And in the larger projects, you have the bigger budget for VDC or clash detection, all that, right. or government projects where, the, you know, they spend money, they, you know, whatever. It's just a spec. <laughs> you spend the money, you know. But in the private light commercial where we are, we are always at the front saying that kind of stuff. And I think with what I'm hearing, we've been there too a thousand times because, I mean, it could be as simple as fucking, I don't know. Everybody just wants to put a fucking five ton everywhere. They don't even know that that needs an economizer. And it's just like, man. It's true. It doesn't work. And then it's only a single stage. And, it's, and, and you know, there, there's so many problems from the HVAC perspective, which is cool about being here. 
I mean, if we were live streaming right now, we might have, hopefully our phones would be blown up with other people and be like, yeah, totally. Everybody that's in the HVAC world has dealt with this. This is not unique. You but know? I think the thing that we need to learn and, and take away from this is just the, the more that we can define up front, whether it's an RFI or grilling the customer, again, the disconnect is always between us. We're not talking to the end user. We're not talking to the owner. Mm -hmm. We don't get to carry that that torch. And to me, what's lost in translation is, I shouldn't say lazy contractor, but we all know that's what it is. Mm -hmm. Or a contractor that has not a limited scope, which is a limited side. scope yeah. or a limited experience. They mm -hmm. don't know the questions to be asking the owner. And the learning experience for us as you as an engineer, us as an equipment supplier and an engineer is we have to define this stuff at the beginning. Mm -hmm. We have to ask the questions that we know we're going to be asking down the road. We got to ask them at the beginning. And, yeah. and unfortunately, a lot of times when you ask that question, the contractor just kind of blows you off. Yeah. They're not worried about it. They They're worried about, it says I got to put this equipment in this space and I'm going to charge this much. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to assume that everything's going to go smoothly. So that's what my budget is. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, if we haven't really defined what the customer wants, we're going to be behind the eight ball the whole time. Yeah. And I, I think that was, um, you know, just the project that we just spoke about, um, me having the relationship with the end user and the bringing on the contractor. I mean, I personally recommended the contractor to do this mm -hmm. um, and had a, a friend of mine uh, that's a mechanical engineer lay it out for us. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I was involved in the whole thing. You know, yeah. I, I was a, I was a middleman throughout the entire process. Um, there was never once a discussion from the uh, facilities engineer, nor the lab uh, managers or, or what have you that said, hey, we have a, a new contract and it says that we have to be tight. If we're outside of this, they're not going to accept our terms and we don't get to make their product. Not yeah. once somebody said that to me until, uh, you know, a month ago, whenever they started talking about, well, you're not meeting our tolerances. And I'm like, well, why, why wasn't this spoken about whenever we started designing this? Like, I saw the parameters, but mm -hmm. again, that's very generalized. We see this all the time, you know, 50% mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, plus or minus 5% or 5%. Hey, if I'm keeping an average of 53 in there, we're going to call that good to go. That's That's perfect uh in a in a normal world yeah you know? yeah yeah uh, that's the completely and i think any other engineer that's always a question you ask ask yourself would another engineer given the similar circumstances have made similar decisions they all would have said the exact same yeah. thing the loads yeah. of the load i yeah. mean you really can't do anything about that it's the infiltration and mm -hmm. um the things that we it's out of our control is what is really dictating what's going on in this room right now mm -hmm. um and obviously as is longer this humidifier is working it's a canister type uh electrode uh the more that those electrodes build up in the uh particulates inside of that build up the less efficient that humidifier is being right mm -hmm. so now we're our output's going to have to be more now we're burning more energy and um you know we did over engineer a little bit i think it called for nine pounds we've had an 11 pound modulating uh humidifier in there yeah so you know, now where are we at? So if we put in a new canister and we set all these parameters, we finally get it right. Yeah. Now what's going to happen? But, you know, and uh, what people just fail to understand is that you just said over-engineered. I don't even think that word word exists because I mean, what do you? What we're saying is every design is based on trying to deal with a varied, a myriad of possible conditions of load. Whether it's the outside world and the inside world, the number of air, if you see the, how many CFMs of fresh air, ventilation, all these things are always changing throughout the year. And so we kind of try to boil it down to like the 1% uh, at weather data or something and make some general assumptions. Or you can model it in more detail with that. We were talking about with train, right? You can dive in. You could spend your entire life on one building trying to imagine this building in real life and every single detail that you want to model and perfect it. But like, the equipment that would re that would deal with all of those statistical events, these these conditions of load, is expensive as shit. Right. Oh shit! Yeah, and and I think that what people are overlooking now is, do we want to design to the 
absolute worst case scenario? Or does our budget allow to say, hey, look, 2% of the time, maybe it's not the most comfortable space in the world. Maybe it's not the perfect humidity. But we're willing to not spend a fortune to come up with a solution mm. that now when we're designing to the... I've right, lost that's... sound. Sorry. Now that we're designing to the maybe, let's say, 95% amount of time, mm-hmm. my equipment is better sized. Yep. It's running continuously and dehumidifying and doing the things it's supposed to do as opposed to saying, oh, well, we got to make it so that when we randomly get that 100-degree day, this thing is bone stock at 70 degrees in here. Yeah. If you if you throw away the idea that we're spoiled Americans and that we want everything <laughs> perfect all the time. Yeah. Okay, now we're in a, let's just say, a 7.5-ton instead of a 10-ton machine. Yeah. Said 7.5-ton machine runs all the time, dehumidifies, Compressors are meant to run. They're not meant to cycle on and off all the time. Yeah. They're not meant to bring the temperature down and then let it reheat over the course of two minutes and then come right back on again. Yeah. What, where are we really trying to accomplish? Do we want a well-running system that's not oversized, didn't cost me more up front, mm-hmm. and cost me less to run than a oversized machine that, yes, works great when it's actually 100 degrees outside, but yeah. we live in Virginia. Yeah, we, we got 65, 70% of our days are mild yeah. weather. Yeah, so just to have something that can stand 65% of that condition and then ramp up rarely uh, is expensive. It's not free. And if you design it for that ramp up, then that 65% that you described is going to be damp, shitty, short cycling nonsense. Well, and- damp and shitty is, is the root of that problem. When you oversize equipment, it doesn't run, it doesn't dehumidify. What do you get? Classic example is a church. Yep. You size the church yep. for full load on Sunday. That happens extremely rarely. Yeah. yeah. What, what is that? Uh, maybe 3% of the week, 2% of the week. Mm-hmm. So now we've got oversized equipment that never runs, and now we're growing mold in the sanctuary. Mm-hmm. So now what do we do? Yeah. The better approach would be let's undersize the equipment a little bit. It might get a little uncomfortable by the end of the service. Yeah. But the rest of the time, it's Great. Yeah, and if after they leave, you have some sort of dehumidification cycle that can continue, Correct. it dries it out, and then everything's fine. And then the paper and the printers can actually feed. I'm curious, because we haven't heard from you, Dave. I mean, in your perspective, at, on the facility side, you know, everything that you've heard, or what's in your head right now? So, yeah, so coming from the owner's side, my thoughts are, whenever you start holding money, show me in the contract where we're not fulfilling that. And it goes back to asking all the questions, asking all their RFIs up front. Mm -hmm. Um, If that was a parameter that they're holding money, then in my mind, that needs to be communicated up front in writing on the drawings, part of the design, coordinated with you up front. Um, And if they're not doing that, then they're going to have a hard time in court, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And who's who's held accountable at that point as well? Because it's like, um, you know, one person saying they want this and they think that's everything they needed to say. And then the other party's saying the same thing, like in court, which we all know that it's probably not going to get resolved in anybody's real mm-hmm. favor at that point. Mm-hmm. You know, like who's really accountable at that point um, and who wins? No one. So, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, it's it's kind of a, a lose-lose situation at that point. Um, and, and I think if you're talking about something very minute, um, which I think this humidity thing is, uh, just in my mind. Um, now, if you had a, a, a building that's uh, obviously, you know, a facility that you're running and uh, $2 million worth of damage or, you know, you have mold growing inside of a, a huge facility, that's that's obviously a different problem. But um, uh, it, I, I used a, a bad term when saying over-engineering earlier, um, for, for lack of a better word, but... Um, uh, I think Jeff and I really hit on a lot of uh, energy efficiency uh, equipment, and that's really yeah. what we dial into. Yeah. Um, so, uh, again, I'm going to say over engineering because um, we can actually oversize a piece of equipment if we're using yeah. a, a VRF system, for, per se. Like, you know, if you have a 30 by 30 room, I, I pulled a, uh, a, a conventional eight ton system out of a 30 by 30 room. It probably didn't need that. 
Yeah. Uh, but but I, what I did, I put a 810 VRF in there. It, yeah. It'll probably never go to 100%. It, it might run at 50%. Uh, it a really bad day, uh, you know, it might get up to 80%. But mm -hmm. we're still able to make those changes based upon that that equipment and keep it comfortable all year round. And not only that, make it very energy efficient for the customer. So even if they're spending a little bit more money for that eight ton they probably didn't need, um, they're going to be saving that money within 10 years uh, just for oversizing. And same with every piece of equipment that I put in this particular job is all mm -hmm. modulating equipment. Yes, yeah. yes, it might have been over-engineered in quotation marks. Yeah. But it's capable of doing three pounds of hour of humidification and it's capable of doing 11. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's supposed to ride in a wherever your set point is, right? So whatever you yeah. set it to, that's where it's supposed to ride at. Uh, oh. And theoretically, that's what it's going to do. Over-engineered for me is in a similar category as value engineering as a useless term. Just because, I mean, you know, okay, let's just imagine structural engineering. All right, you want to hold an elephant. 20 feet above the ground. Okay, make a 20 foot tall by six mile wide on the X and Y, uh, you know, axis, just like a plane of concrete, 20 feet off the ground for, for like a mile square. Then it'll hold it up off the ground. Yep. Right? Okay, well, let's make <laughs> that smaller so. and let's make that smaller and let's make it smaller and let's make it smaller until it fails. Now it's under engineered. So technically speaking, it's like saying you're speeding. As soon as you go a single half of a mile an hour over the speed limit, you've, you're have you speeding. So over-engineering is like, what do you mean over-engineering? It still works. It works. Mm -hmm. It's not over-engineered. It cannot exist that way. You either do or don't have the money to pay for what you want to do in this facility. That's what it comes down to. Well, I guess your tolerance is more than than expected um, out of something. You don't, you don't want to be sitting on that fine line of will the elephant fall or will it stand up? You want to, yeah. you want to be like, I know for certain in my mind, especially as a liability standpoint from an engineer, be like, I know that elephant's going to stay up. <laughs> this is a fun example. So what about this <laughs> elephant, right? We have the 20, we have the 20 foot tall square mile concrete holding the elephant. Now it can jump and and do fun things too now on this, right? But it, it, the static load as you get closer and closer, right before it fails, the elephant crashes under engineered fail lawsuit, right? Well, if we're just above that, we're good. Now this elephant fucking jumps up and down <laughs> and breaks it, and now you fucked up the engineering. But nobody told me the elephant's jumping. Yes. You know, that's a great told, example, man. Can, you know? can this elephant be pink? Yeah, this pink elephant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in my mind, it's a pink elephant. Right, but then whose fault is that? Who owns that? Yeah. Yeah, well, that's a good red, question. Red elephants don't really act like that, but... You know, the pink ones. The pink ones are they're crazy. The well, the pink, yeah. If if I I did know, in my and it's my fault. I knew it was pink elephant, and yeah. everybody knows they jump up and down, and so I should have made that assumption, right? But that's funny because that that does come up, right? You should have known. Be like, listen, that doesn't matter to what I should have should done. Have. But we are talking about, and we've been sued. We talked about this, and I've been pretty open with it on the podcast. Like, we've been sued for half a million dollars for a design we didn't do. It all comes down to somebody thought something that. You know what I mean? We excluded the hood design and then suddenly the hood, whoever was doing the hood design, blah, blah, blah. Next thing you know, ripping off the roof, replacing the whole fucking roof because the access, I don't know, you know, you know, the slope requirements. If it's right. too sloped, you need to have like a catwalk. So it's not pulling water or you have serviceability. <laughs> service, service, yeah. yeah. And, and that's the main thing. So instead of adding the catwalk, they didn't want to. So they ripped the whole roof off and then re-slanted it. it, delayed construction by three months. And now they're telling us you owe us for the change, the increase of interest rates for the increase of labor, three months delay, lost revenue, all this shit. And I'm sitting there like, okay, one thing that people don't understand when it comes to that is it's a civil claim, meaning you have to have violated a contract. What contract did I violate? Because mine says the hood design is excluded. It doesn't stop them from still suing us for half a million dollars and me having to fucking hire an attorney. And so this uh, podcast in a lot of ways is inspired by that. Be like, look, what the fuck? Why don't we just tell people the real situation is in this industry and the uh, crazy lack of connection between expectations and reality of what we do, which is yeah. trying to cover a myriad of potential conditions of, of load. You're just speculating. Yeah. Dude. Yeah. It might, yeah. We might as well guess the fucking stock market, yeah. you know? And, and I hate to say it, it's a lot of times it's building owners. They don't have the time. The, the resources to now or money or the or, care or they <laughs> just don't care they say just build me a 30 by 30 room and i want to make money off of this this yeah. is all i care about and i want it as cheap as possible but then when it doesn't work it's your fault yep i think the church example really stands true because 
you've got a customer that doesn't have a whole lot of money, so they're going to get fixed speed equipment. They're not getting the luxury of having variable speed equipment like Bo was talking about. I'm sorry, keep going. <clears throat> they they want a system that's going to work. They tell us, okay, you got 200 people in there. Then they throw a huge party with 400 people in there, and they're complaining that the thing can't keep up. Mm -hmm. So where where do you draw the line of how responsible are we from an engineering perspective and an equipment supplier perspective compared to the unrealistic expectations that everybody has now? Mm -hmm. Everything costs four times as much as it should. Mm -hmm. Everyone's pissed off about how expensive things are. Construction costs have gone through the roof. Yeah. I yep. mean, through the roof. Yeah. Things that, that I would have used to, and Dave and I joke about this all the time. He he gets a budget for something, changing out two one-and-a-half-ton air handlers in Colonial Williamsburg, and he's getting bids in the $150,000 to $180,000 range. And he's like, dude, what what is two, this? You said two one-and-a-half-ton system so let like okay, okay i gotta ask about that what so of course you know whatever you want to make ambiguous for whatever reason you can could you give us a general understanding of what what's happening so my i just heard two one and a half ton systems are going to cost six figures yeah so it's not your everyday building it is a historic building and we have to go through extreme care of not disturbing the 18th century Get a little closer than yep the 18th century uh architecture you know the building the structure mm -hmm. so it's not an easy job it's going to take multiple mobilizations because of the phasing it's like a nine month job kind of thing mm -hmm. but the numbers are coming through the roof yeah and like you know the equipment might be what thirty forty thousand dollars and then the rest is labor the equipment yeah. we concluded was under 20. this was a uh one high pressure duct system and one conventional one and a half ton mini split ducted system. Oh, yeah. my, oh my lord! Okay, so we're, we're talking. Let's be real. I was trying to be nice. <laughs> let's be real. <laughs> yeah, but we're the, talking under twenty. We're probably talking ten grand worth of equipment. And I, I think this goes back to all the assumptions we've been talking about. It kind of groups them together because yeah. I think all four of us here are talking work in a lot of historical renovation type of work, uh, you know, yep. in Virginia, yep. uh, especially. And I, I live downtown Winchester. Um, obviously, Dave's in Williamsburg. He, he's in Salem, Roanoke. I mean, there's some some serious historical things going on down there. And you, yeah. can, you cannot mess with that because... Yep. You know the, the society of uh, architects or whatever they are that, that manage this. You get some deep of all shit. places. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're, I mean, they're extremely tight. And, on their and yes, I can understand from a contractor's uh, uh, standpoint that they they do have to take a lot of risks and things like that. I mean, but the, the price of of that is astronomical for one. And uh, again, back to the the start of what I was uh, was saying, the assumptions that you're going through. You know, mm -hmm. you, if you're renovating a building, there's a lot of assumptions there. Uh, God, reach. What's <laughs> what's the insulation? Like, how much leakage do we have? Like, as an engineer, <laughs> as an engineer, you know, and I'm not an engineer. I, I work with them very closely, and I know enough uh, to be dangerous. But, um, you know, I'm not the one designing it. I can just help uh, provide the equipment and, and uh, give my suggestions. But, in my um, experience, you're not the engineer, but you're the person that saves the engineer's ass, like y'all have we, for us we, before. But yeah, I think Dave just we, brought we up. Try to, yeah. I think Dave just brought up a point that completely summarizes what we've been talking about, which is that it's not defined. Yeah. So maybe if it was defined, better. It said, well, there is horsehair plaster in this wall, and it needs to be replaced with horsehair plaster. Mm -hmm. Well, there is, you know new wooden registers that need to go in here to make them look period mm -hmm. if all that was defined at the beginning would that not reduce the estimates that you got for that job yeah and we did all that so we so, had, so you did we, all we that had all the <laughs> and you still got fucking because <laughs> when you told me these numbers i'm like uh well bo and i'll go down there and do that shit for 120. well but, jeff will uh <laughs> 
<laughs> Jeff will sit on a yeah, cooler we'll and watch the work. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. I, I've witnessed this before. It's true. He yeah. just threw me on the bus. He didn't even ask me about this until I just heard this. Um, Bo and I will do this. Uh, hey, that's 120 great. grand for two one and a half ton split systems. Well, listen, I know you I'll tell you what, I'll come down next weekend and I'll do it for half of that price and we won't tell anybody. <laughs> but I think one of the reasons we got this was because we did go through that effort yeah. and we did identify all these things. Like in the RFP, I said expect at least three mobilizations. Yeah. Because you're it's gonna be in phases. You're gonna have to come in, it's gonna be inefficiencies. Yeah. It is gonna be very labor intensive. And so I think people looked at that and they're like, ooh. And I think oh, they so might have, you're you're over educating them, so that that drove the price up. So I think that might have hurt me. We can't but wait. I'd rather have that in the number, mm -hmm. and they come out in the good, yeah, and everyone's happy. Well, that saves everybody at the end. I yeah. mean, then, then, exactly. exactly. and then you're not yeah, you're not arguing at the end of the day I, about who's paying for what. Uh, I mean, I've known Dave for uh, not very long, but he's very thorough in his work. And I would w rather work with someone very thorough, whether it be an engineer, a facilities engineer, or someone like myself that can clearly define things uh, from the get-go and throughout the project. Say, you know, you get into a renovation that's yeah. a, a retrofit, you, you run into something. Let's all have transparency and communicate here because I, I feel like, especially me coming from... Uh, I don't want to say the bottom, but like being a technician. Now I'm here. Come from uh, the bottom, now I'm here. Yeah, come from the <laughs> bottom, now I'm here. Uh, but I mean, I've seen it like, you know, just coming from, you know, first installing ductwork to being a service uh, technician and then going up into project management and now selling the equipment and working with engineers, architects. Like mm -hmm. I I've seen that all of those levels and communication in the uh, construction world in general is shit. Yeah, it really is. Uh, yeah, I would tough. rather work with a person like Dave, who is very thorough from the get go. Um, me asking all the right questions, the engineer and I talking through this and having the, the the contractor, not with the lowest bid. If he has the lowest bid and we have communicated and talked about, that's perfectly fine. But I think a lot of these building owners and um, investors all they really look at at the end of the day is this bottom number. And they're like, you can do this with whatever we laid out, but yeah, here's your number. That's a red flag right there. Say it's a, it's a million and a half dollar project. Some uh, mechanical contractor comes in and says, Oh, I can do this for 700,000. Oh, okay. Do it. That's not a red flag to someone. Somebody please tell me how you're doing this. Yeah. And nobody cares. Wait, you're diving into something that when I talked to D to Duke Dotson, he's a developer, so he he's always got about four or five active, forty million ish type projects going on. And I was like, everything he was saying about uh, his his perceived value of a good GC is somebody who's familiar with the underwriting process or knows how this loan works or how they adapt, the historic stuff works, blah, blah blah. Because that general contractor could be at the table saying, "Well, here's how we can make the numbers work." Because they've seen the spreadsheet of underwriting. And I, I, I swear to God, man, I feel like the fucking engineering industry needs to know underwriting. They, we should understand how risk is calculated as it relates directly to lending. Because that's the conversation. So let me give you an example. All right, Mr. Restaurant Owner, you have two, three million dollars, whatever the fuck. All right, well, don't spend all of it on your equipment. That's not HVAC, yeah. <laughs> right? So if you're H, if I'm going to recommend another sixty thousand dollars, I know you can't have more than three million dollars in your project, but you also don't need respect to the architects, but a fucking green plant wall, and you also don't need this and this and this. You can have those things once the revenue and cash flow begin, but you need to get this money borrowed. You have to be open. You need the cash flow to start in the first place. Why would you shortchange yourself on something that's going to be fifteen to twenty years? living protecting your building and your inventory from molding right we just talked about that like rotting things inside because you value engineered because you're going for the bottom dollar what you're talking about but as consultants understanding how they're thinking like and why they're thinking that right it's not just because they're being cheap it's because the bank literally won't give them more money and and if that's the case then if you understand that you can say all right i get it you're not getting more than three million dollars but it's like restaurants is a great example. We do tons of them. I just tell people to stop fucking thinking you need a 50 foot hood. That's ridiculous. <laughs> you, you don't, or you're not going to get your restaurant. Well, the way that, that you can communicate to those people that they don't need a 50 foot hood is that you need somewhere in the 200 to 300 CFM per foot of yeah. hood yeah. for makeup air. 
Yeah. So now plus a short hood. That that extra <laughs> ten foot hood just cost you another twenty five hundred dollars in in makeup air and exhaust. Yeah. That's a tangible number. I mean, and if you're talking to someone educated, they would understand that. I feel like most of the time we're having to use layman terms to talk to these owners, and um, they have this big dream, of course, and everybody does. You know, you Mm -hmm. want to you want to be a successful business, so on and so forth. Um, I think we can all sit around this table and say HVAC is probably one of the the most critical things you can do when it comes to construction. And I think any GC would probably tell you that too. Any good GC would say, listen, if yeah. you're going to spend money somewhere, spend it on your HVAC. Because mm-hmm. um, if you don't have that, then you're it's basically going to go to shit. And yeah. you could even talk to a, uh, a homeowner about that. You know, you, you can buy this house. Um, you know, what, what uses the most energy in your house? HVAC equipment, right? Yep. Um, are, are you going to buy uh, just a, a shitty off the uh, this Mr. Cool thing just blows my mind. You know, <laughs> I'm gonna a Mr. Cool from fucking the, Lowe's. The, I'm like, yeah. I'm like, dude, if you do that, I'll never talk to you again. I'll block your number <laughs> on my phone. Um, and I don't know how many times I've gotten these calls from people and they're like, hey, will you come fix on Mr. Cool? I'm like, no. Yeah. Like, what do you mean? Should, no? You should never bought that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I told you not to do that. And like, why would you buy something like that? That's crazy. It is crazy, Tim. Yeah. Um, People don't spend know. the money up front on critical HVAC equipment. Make your customers comfortable. Make your kitchen work properly. Make those things valuable. Um, I think there's some uh, percentage out there. If uh, you buy a house without HVAC, and there's a lot of them around Virginia, I know, they have just like window shakers and uh, electric heat strips around the the thing. Mm-hmm. That's the If I was in the real estate market, that's the first houses I'd be looking for because you know what? I'd put in a new HVAC system. The house would go up 30% on you, the market just by doing a 10 grand job. Do you do you uh, listen to Bigger Pockets podcast by any chance? I do not. Uh, because it's a real estate podcast and they, they mention the same thing. When you are when you see a for rent sign, it means for sale. That's one. And then the other is when you see uh, somebody with a window unit, that's one to buy. Yep. Mm-hmm. I, I, I bought my house literally with a one window shaker. It was through the wall, went in through a window mm-hmm. and had, <laughs> had heat strips yeah, all around. And I was that. like, I want that house. Yeah. I went so much value. I ripped that thing out, patched the wall, ripped out all the, the heat strips, put in HVAC. My house appraised like two years later, almost double what I bought it for. Yeah. I mean, you know, of course I'm an HVAC guy. I did it myself. Oh. But it's still at that time. Yeah. Uh, was it uh, ten years ago? Maybe uh, it maybe would have cost me nine grand to have that system put in. Yeah. Uh, even if I was, you know, just a, a regular homeowner getting it through a, a contractor. Um, yeah. People, people under it because you don't see it, right? Engineering in general and and MEPs, we're behind the walls. We're if, like electricity is literally a, a force of the universe. Electromagnetism, one of the other, the four, four three force, four forces. There's gravitational waves. And there's nuclear, two nuclear forces. So these are things you don't even see in real life, but they impact real things that we interact with. Thank you. So it's very difficult to communicate to somebody who's buying stuff who wants to see really cool gadgets like this shit yeah. versus the software that's paid for or behind the scenes and the communication as it relates. Again, the whole podcast is about coordination and how can we make it better. There's a Coors Life cracking open. I really like that sound. <laughs> Ice cold curve. Yeah, we're, we're having the best sound. That was the only way you could get us to show up. <laughs> yeah, I know. I wish I had it. You should have given me the, hey, give me a clip. Uh, but yeah, so the the owner. Okay, so let me back up a little bit. We've talked so so many things, and of course, we got to go watch a football game here soon. And unfortunately, because now we're starting to dive into some really cool shit. But we've we've touched on a lot. The owner being everyone's experience, and and you represent the owner in your role, right? Like that's yeah, your, I'm yeah. an owner's rep. So so this is great because we have the engineer, like the fucking the one, engineer. The, 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 the have, like we just so everybody's listening. We have <laughs> two weeks or less engineer. Mm-hmm. No, and then we have the rep uh, who sells equipment. We, and Jeff is a professional engineer as well. He's licensed and registered, and that was one of the main reasons I really was interested. And y'all saved literally saved permit tips ass from if you didn't come into that church job and change it, it would have been a fucking nightmare. <laughs> So they are great engineers themselves. Again, you have your 15 years experience. And so you have all of this experience coming to the table as the rep. And then you are also a registered professional engineer. This is David that I'm talking about. Let me switch cameras so you can see him. Uh, that's Jeff and uh, yeah, over here. So he represents the owner. He's worked in the commercial, I think, uh, for other companies in the commercial design side and on both sides. And then I am the engineer. So you have 
all of these people who end up like in the same industry fucking shitting on each other if something goes wrong because like wait was it your fucking spec or was it my bullshit or was it the owners you know and this is good to have at the table in this conversation but uh the commissioning which you used to do is another thing and then and we talk about this project with the five percent or two percent over humidity whatever it is part of the commissioning process and you will need to correct me if i'm wrong because i've never done it is sitting down with the owner and and discussing what are their realistic expectations so they can be tested against in the future and if that's that conversation never happens then really nothing can be done all you have is the code so can you tell us a little bit about that right so any commissioning process one of the first things you do is the uh, owner project requirements you sit down and you ask them how tight do you need to have your humidity what are your yeah. temperatures what are your schedules like everything you know programming about the building mm -hmm. how's it going to function what are your expectations and what are your requirements yeah that's what you use to set up the construction documents which the commissioning agent uses to back check, right? So it all starts mm -hmm. at the beginning. It all starts with having the owner set clear expectations, clear requirements. And a lot of times they don't do that, but they're the one with the money. So, you know, mm -hmm. they're holding on the money thinking they're right and they won't admit they're wrong. So, so in that role then, the, again, this all starts from the lending process. What I'm starting to realize after these conversations or the funding process. Right, follow the process. money, right? right. Yeah, we, we actually have a Ten Commandments that permits it. One of them is follow the money uh, mm -hmm. because if you're trying to figure out where the root of the problem is or how to make sure you don't have a problem is follow the money, who, and, and that's important. And a commissioning, I would guess, is a, a useful skill is to understand how to communicate to the owner what's realistic and what's not. If they say, that, you can't just say, that's your spec, let me write it, and then let me give you your test, right? You should say, hey, that's a terrible spec. Unless, like, your budget is $150,000. There's no way in hell you're ever going to get anything for hundred fifty grand that will ever test that way. Right. Period. Or, or if you want something that tight, just know that a it's maybe not the greatest idea, or that's not really industry standard. But it comes with a price tag, mm -hmm. and so that commissioning agent or whoever the programmer is, the owner's rep at the beginning, is really setting the stage for how the project is going to execute in the end. Yeah. Because if you don't do it up front, then you end up with these issues at the end where we were never told this, and yeah. now they're being held their feet to the fire probably because of some government agency or some requirement that they have to comply with legally to get their funding yeah and now the project is where it is so well this is brings up just generally why there are limitations of liability in what we do and we have it in our contracts the limitation of liability and people are like oh you fucking bullshit i mean that's what really saved their ass on this half million dollar claim if that wasn't in there i'd be fucking on the hook for a lot more it was a limitation to the fee and i was sued for something i didn't design so that fucking shit protected me, mm -hmm. you know, unless you're going to pay me a half a million dollars to be your fucking engineer, like every single day, call me and I belong to you type engineer, then this fee that you wanted to be this low comes with a limitation of liability to that fee because the decisions I'm making are extraordinarily risky. My insurance has skyrocketed because we started doing more mechanical. And because of that, the underwriting said, oh, that's a lot more risky. And we just talked about that mechanical is one of the most fucking contentious things there is. Nobody fucking understands it from the owner perspective. And so they always think it's been messed up. They never think that it's my fault for thinking that I could get really cool things for free. You know? Okay. I, I think the, the takeaway that we have learned in the last, especially five years is <clears throat> writing RFIs. Like we're working on a meat processing plant right now where we were contracted to do the mechanical engineering just for the refrigeration piping and systems once we read all the information that the contractor sent us there was letters from the usda guy on recommendations on what he thought needed to be done and it's a classic example of well we'll just put refrigeration units in well now we have humidity issues now we yeah. have no ventilation now we have all these other problems so what we did as a team was to put an rfi together addressing every single point that we thought needed to be incorporated in the mechanical design. Mm -hmm. How much hot water do you need to wash down these bays? Where do we need to put drains? Do we need clean yes. outs? Can a truck get to the clean out? The things that we've learned that we've watched people screw up over the years, mm -hmm. what can we ask now at the RFI point to the owner? Because again, yeah. I'm not talking directly to the owner. Yeah. I'm talking to a contractor. Yeah. 
who's got a job on a budget that they threw out with a dart and got. Yeah, and now they're held. And now yeah. they're held to that. And yeah. it's it's shame on them, really, at mm-hmm. the end of the day, mm-hmm. because they should have done more homework up front. They should have been asking the questions that we're asking now. Mm-hmm. They should have been asking them in the in the bidding phase. And that puts everybody in a really tough spot because, um, to Jeff's point, you know, whenever you get, whenever somebody brings you in, uh, Jeff or I, into this um and we reach out to the engineer um the engineer the only yeah the engineer, only engineer that exists here uh, <laughs> the know. only one in chicago this week actually <laughs> in chicago in this um, room right now that's <laughs> not <laughs> either, either. Um, you know it puts us in a tough spot and we are giving this this budget and we're like well you know you really should do it this way and then, well we can't because we're held to this expectation yeah and then you're Again, we're back to making assumptions, and uh-huh. obviously, our job is to look out for the best interests of everyone, right? Uh, yeah, it, I've never walked into a job I'm like I want this job to fail. I don't think anyone's ever done that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that would yeah. be <laughs> that's no, absurd. We just talked about that. Everybody <laughs> wants an, a good outcome. Like in the last yeah. podcast, Architect was saying the same thing. We all want a good outcome. And, and then know? when you pointed out earlier, like everyone starts pointing the finger at each other. Like, well, all right, well. My first thing is like, hey guys, let's stop pointing the finger at each other. Let's mm-hmm. actually come to like have a healthy conversation about how we're going to resolve this, mm-hmm. and everyone take accountability because mm-hmm. it's not one person's fault. It, it, most of the time, it's not. I would say, mm-hmm. um, and let let's resolve the issue rather yeah. than fighting each other over this. And if the owner needs to come up with more money then that's just what it needs to be. Yeah, I go back to contingency on that topic because what what you're talking about is the purpose of contingency, which is to say we know mistakes will be made because of how invariably crazy and unpredictable this industry is. And so there's no way to assume you'd have a 100% perfect thing. And so being honest with the owner up front about how you should have your contingency, I see you've, yeah, what you got. But like you are saying at the beginning, like risk, there's always risk. Mm-hmm. That contractor that landed the job is taking a calculated risk. Mm-hmm. They know they don't have all the information. Mm-hmm. They're hoping they teamed up with the right people, which they did, and then we'll we'll bail them out. <laughs> but they they could have teamed yeah. up with someone who didn't know, give them the bare bones, and then had problems at the end. And they would have because right. they hadn't defined anything. Right. But yeah. That's the risk that all these contractors are taking. But both hit the nail on the head. I mean, that's the way this industry works. These people are dealing, dealing and dealing and trying to get, you know, work. Mm-hmm. And your developers don't give a shit. They're not the end user. They're just trying to turn a number over to the freaking owner. And it just gets caught up in this. Hurry up and give me a number. And nobody ever does their homework. And if if you're going to be an intelligent owner... You, you get a team together that actually presents all the stuff at the beginning, ask the right questions at the beginning so that you actually get what you want. This is good, but the motif has been everybody that we've talked to so far, including the developer, the owner risk is, is a very important consideration. And then we've read, I've read, I say we, I mean, I mean, I, cause I read stupid nerdy shit is a, 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 like a PhD paper of somebody in China that had done this study of, I think we talked about it maybe over dinner. I don't know, but we, they had done, they looked at 40 projects and of the, and, and they looked at them with five major risk categories. And then each of them had five sub risk categories, basically. And it, long story short, they were measuring the, the risk of delay of construction and the risk of cost overages in construction, two numbers that, that would be calculated. They ran this uh, with the 30, uh, 40 real projects, 30, they ran into a neural network. It's a two dimensional neural network for any AI fucking nerds out there. So they ran it in, gave it the inputs uh, and the, the weights for inputs and gave them the real outputs of the projects. Then the next 10 projects, they gave only the inputs to say, these are the risk factors for these projects. Give us a prediction of risk. And it did predict almost like ridiculously accurately how much these projects would have been delayed and over and and, in the overage uh, for cost. And one of the risk factors that had the highest sensitivity on predicting risk was the uh, experience of the team, but also the experience of the owner. And so it's not a coincidence that what I'm hearing is... So the more educated the owner is and the more involved they are, and I sound like a robot now. Yeah, I'll fix that. But, uh, (laughs) I mean, that's it right there. That has not changed. If if the owner actually is educated in making quality decisions, then you might have a good job.
Well, yeah, I, and the engineer uh, said something earlier that I, I want to touch on again. Um, you know, if it's a newer owner that has this big, these big hopes and dreams for this uh, business, uh, maybe a restaurant that uh, I think you were referring to earlier yeah. or whatever it is, you know, mm -hmm. open up in a new shop and like they want this, uh, you know, this, they got with the architect and the architect is blowing smoke up their ass. Like, hey, we need this great mm -hmm. wall of, uh, you know, all these crazy looking things that people are yeah. going to be attracted to. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's great and all, but first you want to find out if your business is going to succeed. Right. Yeah. And most businesses, new businesses are going to fail within the first two or three years. Right. Yeah. So, uh, you bought all this crazy, nice shit that everybody can see, but what did you do on the backside of that? Um, mm -hmm. did you just, are you giving a good product or supplying good food? Because if you're doing that, you're going to make money. So yeah. put in a good HVAC system, have good construction, have a nice ambiance, make great food. That's your deal. Yeah. The, the, I think a, the job of any good consultant is to, to let somebody know when they're over constrained. Have y'all ever seen that video? It's a funny, it's an older video of like this board of direct, like this SME subject matter expert at the table, plus like the project manager person. And then plus the client and they're like, we want you to draw three perpendicular lines, two of them <laughs> red. And two of those red lines invisible or some bullshit, right? Some ridiculous constraint thing. And the professional, the SME is like, well, I just don't think that. And then the project manager is like, no, 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 please don't interrupt the client. He simply wants three perpendicular lines. That's all he wants. I think you should be able to figure it out, Charles. You know, that kind of bullshit. And anyway. Great voice, by the way. Thank you. Appreciate that. It's the engineer. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the, the point of the, the, this is, is we've recently had that. And I just, I, I can't tell you how satisfying as it was to tell this woman, uh, that she was the three perpendicular line person and in her reaction knowing exactly who i was pointing to because she was telling me she wanted this big ass hood in a restaurant with a tiny little roof that they want to hide all the equipment right so the the extent of the height of this roof uh canopy to hide it might be from the floor to here but they we need a paragon unit you know and and all this other stuff like we needed to be comfortable we don't have three-phase power we don't want to see it on the roof the roof is tiny there's barely enough to cover it make it work engineer and I'm like, it's just not going to work. You need to just take one of these things out. One of them could be make the roof smaller so I can give you smaller fans, all this other shit, right? Put it on the ground. And she was literally, she told me, you need to stop telling me that. It can't work. I was like, no, that's like telling a structural engineer the elephant won't eventually fall through the fucking concrete oh, one day. You yeah. know? It's funny. I, we just went through a job like this. I have a dehumidifier in this, uh, this pool house. And... <laughs> These guys uh, yeah. have cool. been up and down this, uh, you know, this road, and they they sign off from the submittals, ready to go. They're building the building, and this humidifier. I mean, lead times are crazy right now in dehumidifiers. I mean, we're we're looking at uh, 28 weeks, and I think DCA is probably one of the best in the business right now, uh, as far as I know, as manufacturers. Shout out DCA, um, DCA, Allah. Um, but anyways, uh, you know, this thing had been submitted. They're building the building, and. They, and uh, they never gave me the uh, the line set links. And they said, hey, you know, this line set's gonna go up like 50 feet and across mm -hmm. like 20 on each side. And I'm like, well, that's not gonna work. You know, high gas reheat, you know, we're, we're sharing refrigerant here. Like we're never gonna be able to return back. You're just gonna flood a compressor. Yeah. We're gonna be failing compressors probably every six months. Yeah. Well, they never gave me these details. They didn't even give me a pair of drawings. They were just like, here's the schedule, <laughs> yeah. match it. And that, so, so that's what I did. And we got the job obviously, but, um, we it got sent back up to the architect and said, Hey, we can't do this. Mm -hmm. Um, the owner's refusing to put this on the roof or not, yeah. not to put it on the roof. They went on the roof. They, they're like, we want this hidden. Yeah. I'm like, listen, this is a demon. If this is a remote condenser, it doesn't even have a compressor inside of it. It always is a fan and a freaking coil. Like mm -hmm. you're not even going to hear the thing. And by the way, it's not even as big as this coffee table we're talking at right now. Yeah. Uh, so we they went back and forth for it's almost been a month, right? Yeah, and um, and, and took the thing out of production yeah. for a month and a half it was on a, a custom, long lead custom time unit because they couldn't make a decision about where to put this stupid condenser. And I'm like, guys, why why weren't the drawings given to us at the very beginning, and why is the owner so? restrictive about putting this thing on the ground. Like it's not even an eyesore. You could build literally a, a fence around it the size of that couch. I mean, it's a it's just astronomical uh, that they can't get it through their heads um, that to your point, um, that's just not how things work in the engineering world. Like mm -hmm. we have motors, we have mechanical things that are operating. Like 
a lot of times when I'm talking in layman terms about HVAC, I often talk to the end user or customer about a car going down the interstate. I'm like, if you take a car, we hit the, the interstate, we're going 80 miles an hour. Do you expect that thing to stop when you hit the brakes like yeah. zero to miles an hour? And do you expect it to take off to 80 as soon as you hit the gas? Doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. These are mechanical things. These are motors. They, they mm -hmm. have gears. There's a lot of things involved here. Mm -hmm. um, we are not talking about um, putting a framing a wall over here, which is pretty much the same every time, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. They, they just can't get that through their heads. And um, it, the more you try to educate them about that, the more resistive they become because then they think you're demeaning them by telling them they can't do that. When I'm like, no, but like physically you can't like, <laughs> yeah, there, no, there's like science behind this, yeah, exactly. guys. I was like, no, it's not going to work. These constraints. <laughs> Have you ever been to work. physics class? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We we lost the camera. We'll see if it comes. If you, if that pops back on, let me know. But we will have to wrap up soon because we got to go to the game. But yeah. um, so we'll do that. We'll do that for now since we lost the camera because there's tons more questions, tons of shit to talk about. But I I would imagine everybody at this conference would be tuned in, and we need a little bit more from the owners' rep uh, perspective too, because we're just. You know, we're on that side of it from our side, but there's definitely, we didn't have a chance to dive as much where I'd like to be, but on the owner's side, like, yeah, but fucking, I mean, what do you expect me to do in X, Y, Z situation? You know, and, and you've been on both, which is cool. So, but anyway, that's, uh, that's all we have time for because we're about to go get a bow, couple more bow, beers, bow. listen to some football, have some fun. And yeah. Yeah. We'll see y'all next time. Later, guys.